day and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Q3 2024 Franklin Covey Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question, please press star 1-1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Derek Hatch, Corporate Controller. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us. We're glad to have the opportunity to talk with you today. Participating on our call this afternoon are Paul Walker, our Chief Executive Officer, Steve Young, our Chief Financial Officer, Jennifer Colosimo, President of our Enterprise Division, and Sean Covey, President of our Education Division. Before we get started, I would like to remind everybody that this presentation contains forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Forward-looking statements are based upon management's current expectations and are subject to various risks and uncertainties, including but not limited to the ability of the company to grow revenue, the acceptance of and renewal rates of our subscription offerings, including the All Access Pass and Leader in Me memberships, the ability of the company to hire productive sales and other client-facing professionals, general economic conditions, competition in the company's targeted marketplace, market acceptance of new offerings or services and marketing strategies, changes in the company's market share, changes in the size of the overall market for the company's products, changes in the training and spending policies of the company's clients, and other factors identified and discussed in the company's most recent annual report on Form 10-K and other periodic reports filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Many of these conditions are beyond our control or influence, any one of which may cause future results to differ materially from the company's current expectations. Uh -huh. And there can be no assurance the company's actual future performance will meet management's expectations. These forward-looking statements are based on management's current expectations, and we undertake no obligation to update or revise these forward-looking statements to reflect events or circumstances after the date of today's presentation, except as required by law. With that out of the way, we'd like to turn the time over to Mr. Paul Walker, our Chief Executive Officer. Thank you, Derek. Welcome, everyone. It's great to be with you today. We're pleased with our results for the third quarter, where revenue, adjusted EBITDA, and free cash flow were all stronger than expected, and where, importantly, several of our key leading growth indicators strengthened. Specifically, I'd like to point out, as shown in slide four, revenue came in at $73.4 million versus the $72.2 million we'd expected. Adjusted EBITDA came in at $13.9 million, versus the expected range of between 12 and 13 million. And free cash flow was $30.6 million through the third quarter versus 15.6 million through the third quarter of last year. This strength was broad based across both the enterprise and education divisions. Additionally, the foundation for accelerated future growth is being established by our 9% increase in our balance of build and unbuild deferred revenue which increased to $153.2 million and which will be recognized in the coming quarters, as well as by our increased services booking rate, which will flow through to revenue in the coming quarters. In addressing our performance for the quarter and our outlook for the future, I'd like to address four key drivers that continue to accelerate the growth and value of Franklin Covey's business. Each of these drivers were particularly evident in the third quarter's performance. As you can see shown on slide five, the first driver of growth and value is the mission critical nature of the opportunities and challenges we help organizations and schools address and the strength of our solutions in addressing them, both of which are reflected in the continued resiliency in our business. A recent June 11th Bloomberg article reported that, quote, businesses are holding off on capital expenditures and reducing costs, close quote. Despite an uncertain and challenging environment, Franklin Covey's business continues to be strong and highly resilient. In the enterprise division in North America, as we'll describe in more detail in a moment, we achieved our highest ever all access pass logo retention percentage for a third quarter, our highest ever absolute revenue retention, and one of our highest revenue retention percentages for any third quarter. And in the education division, the number of new and retained schools is pacing well ahead of last year through the third quarter. This continued strength and resiliency reflects two things. First, the importance of the opportunities and challenges we're helping organizations and schools address. 
And second, the broadly recognized strength and efficacy of our solutions in addressing them. I'd like to just say a couple of uh, additional points about uh, each of these. First, as to the importance of what we're doing to help our clients. The types of challenges and opportunities we help organizations achieve are not just nice to have. They're truly mission critical. For organizations, achieving extraordinary strategic or business outcomes almost always requires building winning cultures, achieving extraordinary execution, earning the highest levels of customer loyalty, and building leaders who can unleash the collective power of their people. Underpinning each of these outcomes is the need for the most impactful behaviors and actions of people at scale throughout an organization. Achieving such large-scale collective action is not just nice to have, it's mission critical. Second, as to the tremendous strength and efficacy of Franklin Covey's solutions in helping organizations successfully address these opportunities and challenges, Franklin Covey's solutions combine best-in-class content with high-leverage tools and coaching and measurement, all of which is available across any delivery modality. The power of our solutions helps Franklin Covey earn the right to be partners for life with our clients. The second driver I'd like to talk briefly about is the strength of our leading indicators of future growth, which were also strong in the third quarter. Three key leading, leading indicators of our future growth include growth in the amount of our deferred revenue, which directly reflects, reflects growth in our contracted and invoiced revenue that will be recognized over the next 12 months, growth in the amount of unbilled deferred revenue, which represents increases in the dollar volume of multi-year contracts, which establishes a strong foundation for growth even beyond 12 months, and growth in the amount of services booked in the quarter for future delivery. Each of these key lead indicators of future growth was strong in the third quarter. As you can see shown in slide six, our balance of deferred revenue increased 15% to 83.8 million in the quarter, reflecting growth in revenue amounts contracted and invoiced in the quarter. Our balance of unbilled deferred revenue increased 2% to 69.4 million during the third quarter, reflecting an increase in the dollar volume of multi-year contracts, which typically flows into revenue over the ensuing 18 to 30 months. Additionally, I would also add that as we expected, in the third quarter, our services booking pace accelerated meaningfully, and the accelerated pace has continued through the month of June. The third driver of growth and value is the strength of our business model. Our business model is designed to achieve high levels of recurring revenue with strong gross margins, with operating SG&A as a percent of revenue that declines with scale, and with very little working capital required since the invoice revenue is billed and collected before the revenue is recognized. The combination of these factors results in a high flow through of increases in revenue to increases in both adjusted EBITDA and free cash flow. For example, for the latest 12 month period ended May of fiscal 2020, revenue at the time was $214.6 million and adjusted EBITDA was $18.8 million. This compares with revenue and adjusted EBITDA through the latest 12 months through this year's third quarter, where re revenue had grown during that period to $281 million and adjusted EBITDA to $48.8 million. With revenue growth of 31% during that period, adjusted EBITDA grew an even more rapid 160%. This pattern of strong flow through continued in this year's third quarter where revenue grew $1.9 million, or 3%, and adjusted EBITDA grew $2 million, or 17%. The final of these four drivers I'd like to talk about today is that uh, we've been able to invest our free cash flow and excess cash in the business at high rates of return, with the balance being returned to shareholders in the form of significant stock repurchases. In fiscal 2024, our return on net tangible assets from investments in the business continued to be remarkably high. As shown on slide 7, year-to-date, we've returned $25.8 million to shareholders through purchasing 649,000 shares, including returning $7.4 million through purchases of 188,000 shares in the third quarter and we've invested $61.4 million to repurchase shares over the last two years. 
Our board also approved a new $50 million stock repurchase authorization to put ourselves in a position to continue to opportunistically return capital to shareholders through continued stock repurchases. Additionally, we continued to make significant progress in each of the three growth projects I described in detail last quarter, Project Penetrate, Project Speed to Ramp, and Project Impact. And we're encouraged with what we see in terms of these projects driving future accelerated growth. I'm pleased with the progress we're making. I'm pleased about our outlook for growth and what we're doing to become even more important to our clients. I'd like to now turn time to Steve to share details about our specific Q3 results and discuss guidance. After Steve concludes, we'll open the line and look forward to answering your questions. Steve. Uh, thank you, Paul. I would like to briefly provide a little more detail on the factors underlying our performance, focusing on the overall company result and then on the results in three key areas of our company, specifically our enterprise division in North America, the enterprise business internationally, and our education business. As shown on slide eight, third quarter revenue was 73.4 million, 3% higher than the 71.4 million generated in last year's third quarter. Year-to-date revenue was 203.1 million, was slightly higher than the 202.6 million in the prior year. And for the latest 12 months, revenue was 281.1 million compared to the 281.4 million in the prior year. Third quarter adjusted EBITDA was 13.9 million compared to 11.9 million achieved last year. Year to date adjusted EBITDA was 32.3 million compared to 31.6 million last year. And for the latest 12 months, adjusted EBITDA was 48.8 million compared to 44.9 million last year. As shown on slide nine, results in our enterprise business in North America continued to be strong in the third quarter. Revenue in North America, which accounts for about 73% of total enterprise division revenue, was 39 million in the third quarter, which is flat with the 39.1 million recorded in the prior year. Year-to-date revenue and the latest 12 months revenues were also essentially flat versus uh, last year after FY23 recorded large increases over the same period in FY22. Subscription revenue in North America was 22 million, reflecting growth of 3% in the quarter. Was 66.5 million year to date, which is up 5%, and 88.5 million in the latest 12 months, which is also up 5%. The combination of subscription and subscription services revenue in North America was $35.9 million in the third quarter, representing 3% growth. This revenue was $102.2 million year-to-date, which is up 2%, and was $137.3 million latest 12 months, which is up 3%. Our balance in deferred revenue, build and unbuild in North America, continued to be strong, growing to $111.6 million in the quarter, which is up 3% on top of the 19% growth achieved in last year's third quarter, establishing, as Paul talked about, a strong foundation for next year's uh, growth. And the percent of North America's all-access passes contracted for multi-year periods increased to 55% from 50% in the third quarter last year. And the percentage of invoiced revenue represented by multi-year contracts increased to 60% from 57% in the third quarter last year. As shown on slide 10, revenue from our international direct operations, which accounts for approximately 17% of total enterprise division revenue 
was 8.5 million in the third quarter, which was down 7%. This decrease is more than 100% attributable to the geopolitical issues related to China, as every other international direct operation grew revenues over the prior year. Year-to-date revenue from these offices was 24.4 million, which is down 5%, and the latest 12 months revenue was 33.9 million, uh, down 2%. As also shown on slide 10, our international licensee partner revenue was 2.7 million in the third quarter, a decrease of 5%. Well, with year-to-date revenue of 8.8 million down 2%, and the latest 12 months revenue of 11.4 million, which is flat to the prior year. Finally, as shown on slide 11, revenue in our education business, which accounts for approximately 25% of total company revenue, grew to 20.1 million in the third quarter, on top of 18% growth achieved last year. Year Year-to-date revenue grew to 49.4 million, up 8%, and revenue for the latest 12-month period was 73.5 million, up 5%, on top of the 21% growth in the previous year. Education amounts invoiced grew to 18.9 million in the third quarter, up 16% from the third quarter a year ago. Year-to-date amounts achieved were 37 million, up 16%, and for the latest 12 months grew 13% to 82.3 million. Education subscription and subscription services revenue grew to 18.2 million in the third quarter up 13%, on top of 19% growth in last year's third quarter. Year-to-date revenue grew to 44.3 million, up 6%, on top of the 24% in year-to-date growth achieved through last year's third quarter. And for the latest 12 months, education revenue was 67.3 million, which is up 3%, on top of the 21% growth achieved in the same latest 12 months last year. Education's balance of deferred subscription revenue, billed and unbilled, increased to 28.9 million, or growth of 42% in the third quarter. Now a little bit about cash flows and, and balance sheet. As shown on slide 12, Our cash flows from operating activities for the nine months ended May 31st, 2024, was 38.4 million, an increase of 12.5 million, or 48%, compared to 25.9 million for the prior year. Our free cash flow for the first three quarters increased 15 million, or 96%, to 30.6 million compared to the $15.6 million for the prior year, reflecting that changes in the elements of working capital were very favorable through Q3 of this year compared with the prior year, particularly reflected changes in accounts receivable, accounts payable, accrued liabilities, and deferred revenue. For the third quarter, free cash flow was $5.8 8 million compared to 12.3 million in the prior year, reflecting also changes in working capital this quarter. As Paul mentioned, in the first three quarters of FY24, we invested 25.8 million to purchase 649,000 shares. And over the past four quarters, we invested 31.7 million to purchase 774,000 shares. We ended the quarter with nearly 100 million of total liquidity, including 36.3 million in cash and 62.5 million available under the revolving credit facility, even after investing the 25.8 million in stock repurchases year to date. Compared to Q3 of FY23, the sum of build and unbuild deferred subscription revenue increased to 153.2 2 million, 
giving us increased visibility into future revenue results. The deferred subscription revenue increased 15% to $83.8 million, while the unbilled deferred revenue increased 2% to $69.4 million. Adjusted EBITDA for the third quarter, as we said, was $13.9 million, representing 17% growth over the prior year. Now a little bit about guidance. In our second quarter earnings call, we communicated that we expected full-year revenue to be approximately $284 million in constant currency after absorbing what we expected at the time to be $700,000 of unfavorable FX for the year. With Q3 revenue expected to be approximately $72 million and fourth quarter revenue to be approximately $83 million. We still expect full year revenue to be approximately $284 million in constant currency for the year. With Q3 revenue of $73.4 million would make Q4 revenue approximately $80.5 million primarily reflecting a modest shift forward from fourth quarter to third quarter in the education division related to the earlier than anticipated launch of a large statewide contract. In our second quarter earnings call, we also communicated that we expected full year adjusted EBITDA to be within our original the range of between 54.5 and 58 million in constant currency, and to be at the low end of that range, excluding approximately 500,000 of negative FX impact. This result would represent approximately 13% year over year growth, and today we are reaffirming that guidance. We feel good about the building revenue momentum and lead indicators we see and expect a continuation of these trends into FY25 and beyond. Uh, so, Paul, back to you. Thanks, Steve, for taking us through that. Uh, I feel in incredibly good about the renewing growth momentum in the business and the progress we're making on a number of important strategic and operational fronts and just want to express my gratitude to each of you and also to uh, each of our associates around the world here uh, for the great work they're doing. And with that, we'd now uh, like to ask the operator to open the line for your questions. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, please press star 1 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 1 1 again. One moment for questions. Our first question comes from Alex Paris with Barrington Research. You may proceed. Hi, guys. Congratulations on the better than expected third quarter results. Thanks, Alex. Hope you're doing well. Yep, thank you. Um, so I got a couple of questions. Uh, the first one relates to the education division, and then I have a couple of cats and dogs to follow up on. Um, so education division, this is the season. This is the big time of the year for, for education, and I'm uh, – I, uh, I feel good about your, your prepared comment, new and retained schools pacing well. Um, but you got a pretty tough comp. I think the fourth quarter last year, or the full year last year, was a record 791 new schools, also on, on, on strong retention. Uh, how do you feel about that hurdle for, the, for fiscal 2024? Yeah, uh, I'll... I'll... Go, go ahead, Paul. I'll, go I'll, ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say, Alex, I, um, thanks for the question. And uh, I was going to say, let's, let's hear from the man who has to start in the Super Bowl here in the fourth <laughs> quarter, Sean Covey. <laughs> okay. How you doing, Alex? Great. How are you, Sean? Good. Good. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So um, we feel good about it. Um, we have, we're ahead so far on new schools uh, substantially. Uh, last year we had a record 791. We believe we're going to beat that again. This year, and we had good retention. We've always had good retention, and we we uh, feel like it's it's solid and ahead of last year. At this point, we also have um, you know probably the best pipeline I've I've ever seen um, since I've been here. Um, so we've got a lot of a lot of big opportunities coming in. Most of the decisions are made. You know, schools are 
looking and talking with us all year. Most of the decisions are made in um, July and August because a lot of the budgets for K-12 districts renew in July. So a lot of the decisions are made, but we feel really good about it. We have, um, you know, our focus has been on selling to districts. That's going better than ever. Um, you know, they're bigger, they're stickier. You get more schools all at once. Uh, we'll, we think we'll add about 170 new district partnerships this year on top of the 200 to 230 or so we had last year. And then over half of our new schools coming on are coming from districts. So all the signs are really good. You know, you don't know until it happens. Um, but in terms of all the leading indicators, um, pipeline, uh, new schools to date, retention to date, um, also, uh, you know, the funding environment is really positive for us right now because of uh, uh, community support, uh, foundation support, grants that we're winning. Uh, so that's that's been really good. So a lot of so everything is leaning into our favor to have a, a really solid and, and positive growth fourth quarter. Great. Well, good luck on that. Uh, I was going to follow up too on the ESSER funds. Um, you know, sure. uh, I, I think we all know that the ESSER funds are ending in September, although. Uh, business contracted prior to uh, uh, September can be spent through January, as I understand it. Uh, uh, what impact do you think that will have on your business? I know you got the big foundation, you know, that's going to kind of offset some of yeah. that. But uh, maybe just some perspective uh, on ESSER funds. Um, um, sure. You know, what what impact does that have on uh, fiscal 23, fiscal 24, and, and what's your thoughts about going forward? Yeah, so in general, we think uh, ESSER is going to have, you know, it's going to have some impact, how much, we're not quite sure, but all things considered, we feel good about growing right through it. Um, maybe the most encouraging thing is that we've already been facing ESSER all year, because a lot of these schools use their ESSER funds and districts early on, they're coming up for renewal, they don't have ESSER funds anymore, because they've used them all, and uh, they're renewing, you know, and, and staying with us, and so it's kind of like we're halfway through it already, even though officially it ends at the end of, you know, our fiscal year and up through, like you said, through the calendar year, uh, it's, it's kind of like we're halfway through it and uh, we're not, we're growing right through it right now. So um, I'm not ignoring, it won't have some impact, but I don't, you know, we're, we're expecting to grow right through it. And um, primarily because we have so much other funding, uh, Title I grants or, you know, we use them all the time. Um, and we've got this big foundation, which is multi-millions of dollars and hundreds of schools that will be funded through the foundation. We have a lot of other community uh, initiives, um, and uh, that's really helpful. And uh, that big I foundation, that, you said, said uh, multi-million yeah. dollars, obviously. They're going to fund 100 schools in total over time, or 100 no, schools in, in, in this year? Well, I, I said hundreds of schools. Um, they're they're, hundreds. they're okay. supporting, yeah, and they, you know, they don't give – they give so much per student, you know, and so it's like an accelerator, um, which is kind of good because we want the, you know, if we go to a district, we say, hey, we've got a funding partner that can help you get going. It accelerates. Uh, people come on faster and they come on bigger, knowing they've got support. Um, but they have to have some skin in the game, too. So the foundation doesn't cover everything. It usually covers about a third of their costs. And, uh, but it helps tremendously. Um, it makes them feel like, hey, there's somebody out here that believes in this and is going to support me, help me get started, get off the ground. So that's been that's been a really positive thing. And uh, we've we've had about, you know, we've had since the beginning, uh, we've had probably about a, the 30 to 40 percent of our schools have been supported by some kind of community business, um, chamber of commerce, foundation initiative. So it's uh, our, our solution is really powerful, and because of that, it attracts um, like-minded entities that are, you know, wanting to support character development in in, in kids. So it's, that's been a steady thing, and we think it'll help us tremendously get through a COVID bump, or or the ESSER, you know, from from the COVID impact for sure. Great, thanks. That's real helpful. Yeah, sure. that help. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Um, uh, a quick one on restructuring costs. You talked about it on the third quarter. You'd say you said there'd be. Uh, I think we're at three million year to date. Are, are we done with uh, uh, restructuring, or will there be a further charge in the fourth quarter? It looks like uh, 
uh, the number of CPs came down as you had sort of forecast, uh, actually a little less than you forecast. You, you said maybe 24 more would come out. It looked like 20 came out, if I have that right. Uh, so, Alex, the impact uh, that we reported in Q2 and Q3 were from the same initiative, and we don't anticipate any additional restructuring charges in Q4. Okay. And then last question. Um, this is also for you, Steve. Uh, help me and, and your investors understand this. Uh, this has been sort of a nagging point for me. I, I, I should probably understand it, so that's why I'm asking. Uh, uh, deferred revenue was up 15%. Unbilled deferred was up 1% or so. Uh, in total, uh, it was up 8.7% to $153.2 million. But when I scroll down to the balance sheet, deferred subscription revenue is down 16% from 95 to 80. Obviously, that's not the whole number, and it perhaps applies just to subscription, doesn't include services or training days. But uh, what do you, how, how do you explain that? Um, the balance sheet is Q3 versus August year end. versus year end versus the prior year. Does that make sense, Alex? So we're talking about different. Oh yes, it's not year over year; it's just year to date. Yeah. Yeah, we're comparing different periods in one calculation versus the other calculation. Yes. So, so if I looked at it, yeah, if I looked at Q three twenty three, if I looked yeah. at Q three twenty three versus Q three twenty four, yeah. Then the number then should tie out. That makes sense. Okay. And tie Good. Up. Helpful. I'll, I'll take a uh, look at it and make sure I understand it. And if I have any further questions, I'll do it on a follow-up. But thank you very much. And again, congrats on the quarter. Thank, thanks for asking that, Alex, because those are the kind of things that are, that are confusing. So it's good to clarify those when they're in people's minds. Thanks, Alex. Thank, thank you. you. Our next question comes from Nahal Chokshu with Northland Capital Markets. You may proceed. Hi, Thank you. Um, hey, uh, <clears throat> so you know you list a uh, unbilled deferred revenue year year growth of two percent, deferred revenue growth of fifteen percent. I presume that the deferred revenue growth is a much better indicator of your short term billings uh, than the unbilled because that's probably more representative of a uh, flattening and adoption of multi year agreements. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Or you know. Yes, the unbilled or? deferred. Sorry, Nehal. Uh, nice to talk with you. Yes, the unbilled deferred comes from the multi-year agreements, and 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 by its very nature is more lumpy quarter to quarter and period to period uh, than than the deferred. And and the deferred is is normally billed one year at a time, uh, and many of those are one-year contracts or the annual billing of a multi-year. Contract, so so yes, uh, I think the way you described it is exactly right. Okay, great, and that metric undoubtedly represents an acceleration from the prior three quarters, and um, that that is the primary reason why you guys feel very good about the signal of accelerating growth on subscription revenue. Is that correct? Uh, yes. So so. Just as you said, the portion of the unbilled deferred, we know that when that's going to be billed and, the, and as soon as we invoice, we know the pattern that that's going to come in to recorded revenue. Okay, great. And what are your thoughts on the free cash flow for fiscal fourth quarter, especially given what was, I think, a pretty solid free cash flow number for fiscal 3Q? Well, we don't actually have a... a um, guidance for the cash flow in the fourth quarter, but we do expect to end up the year with a very good cash flow number, a good percentage of adjusted EBITDA. We just haven't given guidance on exactly what that is, but we expect to have a, a good free cash flow year. So um, year to date, um, you're trending at above 100% EBITDA conversion of free cash flow. Um, that should not continue into fiscal 4Q, basically. 
Yeah, I think I think that that a hundred percent, you know, stretch over time is a is a higher percentage than what we would expect just in normal circumstances. We've normally been looking at like, well, as as you notice, Nahal, from looking quarter to quarter, that percentage is, you know, sometimes down around 40 percent and sometimes up like 150 percent of adjusted EBITDA. So it's very volatile as a as a comparison to adjusted EBITDA. But we look overall for it to be like 70, 75 percent of adjusted EBITDA. With this year uh, being an abnormally high year so far uh, uh, for several reasons, working capital has gone in our favor for the three quarters, and we've also had uh, some some fairly good uh, prepayments uh, on contracts. So yeah, we're uh, the the hundred percent is it's all real. It, it's just it's just a a number that again we'll probably overall looking year to year be more like seventy to seventy five percent of adjusted EBITDA as a balance of free cash flow. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Dave Storms with Stonegate. You may proceed. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, Dave, good to, good, to, good to hear from you. Great, great to hear from you too. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, just want to start. There's a lot of talk about uh, leading indicators, and I'm hoping we could focus that in on the sales cycle and uh, how closing times are trending. And maybe if you give us a sense of how closing times are trending between uh, uh, renewals and then also uh, any new logos and maybe a sense of what that looks like. Sure. Yeah, great, great question. So, um, you know, I would say that, that generally speaking, there are two very different motions, right? The, what it takes to get a new opportunity through the, through the prospecting funnel into our, into our, uh, you know, our deal progression cycle and to get that closed. And uh, there's a, there's a cadence for that that can take anywhere from, you know, sometimes it's as fast as a month, and and sometimes you know that'll be on average that takes a number of months usually for somebody to go from first interest to closing that first time uh, contract with us. On the renewal side, fortunately, these are clients who have been using successfully our solutions. Uh, we can see that renewal in the pipeline. That renewal is in the pipeline the moment they sign the contract, and we know we're, we're expecting that that's going to convert one year later from that contract. And so uh, uh, what I, I think that the real answer to your question that I think would be most helpful is that generally speaking, uh, we're, we're, we're not seeing elongation, any more elongation right now in either of those than uh, we've, we've seen the last few quarters. In fact, I would say if anything, it's maybe getting a little bit better out there, uh, just the environment, certainly not materially worse in any way, maybe a little bit better for us as we come to the end of the year here. And um, I think that's probably more the question you're you're getting at. Understood. That's that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, and then just looking at the North American market uh, for the enterprise division, you know, nice growth year over year. Uh, any sense of kind of what's driving that outside of you know some of the stuff you've laid out uh, at the top, you know, the, the drivers of growth and value. Um, is there any feeling of if that's pent up demand? Uh, kind of common fruition or, or anything else that may be a lead in that charge? Yeah, uh, again, good question. I'd, I'd point to two things. We've talked about these the last few calls as well. So, uh, and I, and I uh, made a reference to this in my, in my comments earlier. One, in the third quarter, we had, we had quite, quite strong retention. And so one of the indicators of the durability of the business, the subscription business, is the retention of both of, of logos, of the actual clients themselves, but also the subscription revenue. And uh, th- the third quarter was, was very strong. It was among our you know, high water quarters for a third quarter going back over quite a number of years. And so we were encouraged by that. That's a pattern we've seen strengthening. It was strong in Q3. It was, it was also uh, strong in Q2, it was strong in Q1. So coming out of last year, Q, Q2, Q3 time period, where we, those, those retention percentages weren't quite as strong as we had historically been accustomed to, it's been a strengthening quarter by quarter. 
uh, up to this most recent third quarter where it was the strongest it had been uh, in quite some time. So that was that's one uh, kind of leading indicator uh, that, that we saw. The other would be our services. So we talked last quarter quite a bit about the services attach rate in the booking of services. Uh, we, we mentioned that we expected those services, both the, the, the delivered services and the booking of new services that will be delivered in the future to both strengthen, and they did meaningfully in the third quarter. And uh, in fact, they are continuing to strengthen in, to, in through the month of June. So those two things combined uh, contributed to um, improving results and accelerating growth in the third quarter. That's very helpful. Thank you. And then just one more, if I could, uh, thinking about the international markets. I know, Steve, you mentioned that uh, any weakness there was entirely uh, due to, you know, the Chinese market. Uh, I know the Chinese market is kind of giving you fits and starts over the last several quarters. Any outlook there on maybe uh, finger in the wind what we should expect going forward? Uh, as far as what's, you know, going, going forward, uh, we're hoping for a little bit better, better growth there in China. And I think our team's doing great work. Uh, and we're just, there's some, some headwinds we face in China. And, and uh, in fact, Jen, do you want to just give a, a quick comment on China? I know that's something you spent a lot of time on. Yes, of course. Hi, Dave. Um, we are hoping, frankly, as a, as a training and education organization in that space, there are just geopolitical challenges um, for our Chinese citizen teams. They are all Chinese citizens. They're working really hard and doing well, but uh, in our particular space, who they are seeing, or, or frankly, us even being an American company is currently a challenge. And then of course, China has their own economic challenges taking place. So I, I wouldn't venture a guess, Dave, as to whether or not that improves. Understood. That's great color. I appreciate you taking my questions and wish you all the best of luck in the next quarter. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jeff Martin with Roth Capital Partners. You may proceed. Hi, Jeff. Good afternoon, guys. How are you? Great. Um, yeah, I was curious if you could give us an update on you know, new content and content refresh this year. I know you had a lot of activity going on. If you're seeing some revenue uplift associated with that. Yeah, great. So this is this is a big year for us. Uh, we earlier this year launched uh, the we, we've launched two, two two substantial offerings earlier this year, the Speed of Trust uh, refresh. And with that, the, compa the new companion offering uh, around working at the speed of trust, which is the, uh, our, our step away from just addressing trust for leaders, but also extending that content uh, down to uh, individual contributor associates and companies. That's, that's going well. We're pleased with what we're seeing there, uh, particularly the broader adoption of trust now that we have this working at the speed of trust companion offering. Uh, we launched uh, a few months ago, Navigating Difficult Conversations. It's a module on just what it sounds like, how to, have, how to navigate and have difficult conversations. Uh, that's, that's also gaining traction. Uh, we're pleased with what we're seeing there. That's a first in a category for us, uh, the first of a few things we intend to do to strengthen and, and, and round out a, a uh, more fulsome communication category of offerings. That's at the top of the, the, the next top of the list of things our clients would like to see from us. And then, of course, we're right in the middle right now of getting ready to launch this fall the seven habits. This will be the 5.0 uh, edition of the seven habits. That's a. It's been gosh nine-ish years or so uh, since we since we refreshed and updated seven habits last time. That always drives a big cycle for us, and uh, we're we're very excited about uh, that coming this fall. And then in addition to that, there's been a lot on the technology side. The impact platform continues to get. Uh, more and more powerful and more and more valuable to our clients, uh, including uh, AI capability that's now quite infused into that and it's uh, uh, AI coaching capability as well that's built into the platform to help support learners as they're uh, participating in impact journeys and also post impact journey as a support as a performance uh, enhancing support coach, if you will. at all this year and event. Uh, 
Jeff, I think I, I lost you there for a minute. Will you, will you uh, start that question over? Yeah, sorry, it's a little windy where I am. Um, I was just curious if, if you're seeing any uplift in the in, in the back half of fiscal 24 as a result of those, you know, launches or relaunches, and, and if you expect that to have more prominent impact next year. Yeah. We, so the, the, the short answer to the first part is yes. I think that's part of what's helping dri uh, drive an increase in services and certainly what's helping drive an increase in the overall net revenue retention as clients are, are expanding. Uh, to take advantage of these solutions. And then to your second part of your question, yeah, I think the real even more growth is it will happen next fiscal year. When we launch a new product, you can imagine it's, it's another product inside this already powerful all access pass subscription offering. Many clients are in the middle of an impact journey and the new product needs to work its way either into that impact journey or usually what will happen is, is it works its way into the next impact journey that they're participants are going to go on with us. And so there's, there's typically a bit of a lag. It can, you know, take six to really up to 12 months before we start to see the full impact of a new product launch as clients become aware of the new solution. Our client partners have a chance and our implementation strategists have a chance to go in and then plan and plot out what the usage will look like uh, for that then to really, really start to show up in kind of the lagging results around revenue and, and retention, things like that. So early indicators positive, and I think the real action for a couple of these solutions we've launched this year will be felt in fiscal 25. Yep, yep, okay. And then you refer, you, you referred pretty consistently throughout the year about the challenging economic environment. Just curious if you're noticing any you know, sentiment shift among clients in your conversations on either you know a new logo basis or a renewal basis in terms of their propensity to to either you know spend more on these programs or whether they're still kind of in cautious mode. So I would say that the the sentiment, if anything, is neutral to a little maybe a little bit more positive. Uh, it's it's not it's not worse sentiment. Uh, is, how, is how I would how I would characterize that. Uh, if, if, if you know, I think people have their budgets now where we understand what they are. They understand what they are, and our, our client partners and salespeople are doing a great job out there working with clients. And um, hopeful that that continues. And if anything, that the sentiment you know maybe even increases a little bit more. But but who knows? But right now, I'd say it's neutral to maybe even a little bit better. Okay. And then you may I apologize if this is a redundant question, but. Um, for client partners and investment in, in, in new sales, you know, growth from client partners uh, in fiscal 25 and beyond. Yeah, great, great question. So we, uh, uh, and Alex picked up on this a little bit too, we, we actually added back uh, four net new client partners in the quarter. So we've gone down by 24 uh, at the end of last quarter, and then and, and then uh, went back up by four. So I think we're at 269 at the end of at the end of Q3. Uh, last quarter, I laid out in in quite a bit of detail uh, three important growth accelerating projects. Uh, project impact, which is around content and making sure we we continue to field the best set of solutions to kind of drive our 10-year product roadmap and vision, uh, and then projects. Speed to Ramp and Project Penetrate, which are about getting at this lar very large addressable, but not yet fully addressed by us market that's out there. And so uh, a lot of work's being done with our in our sales org right now on how do we accelerate and enhance our go-to-market motion. And, uh, and so m more client partner hiring in fiscal 25, certainly, than going backward in fiscal 24. And, uh, and we're right now in the middle of, mo of modeling that out. We'll be able to give a good update uh, as we kick off the new year, exactly what that looks like. I would just say, you know, as a, we, 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 here we are today with a field, a field facing force of around 450 people between our client partners, our implementation strategists and our coaches. That's, it's, it's the largest we've ever had. Uh, and, and we look at the addressable opportunity out there and we, we, you know, we, we look at companies like Gartner, we, we, of course, love to be Gartner in a lot of ways. We're, but, but we look at companies like that and say, wait a minute, that we're selling to, a very, to very similar audiences, senior leaders inside companies of all sizes. 
We have a powerful subscription offering. We add services to that, and the solutions we're selling are, are, are really important, and, and, and our client organizations need access to these solutions. Gartner's got 5,500 people in their sales organization. And so there's a, there's a, I, I'm, I'm quite excited about the headroom to grow this and the work that's being done right now to get in and really map that out um, in, in, in an even more aggressive way than we have in the past and, and look forward to talking you know, more about that as we get ready to kick off this goal 25. Very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Jeff. you. I would now like to turn the call back over to Paul Walker for any closing remarks. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Josh. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for joining today. It was, it was great to be with you. We appreciate uh, all that you do to, to follow the company and understand the company and for your great questions and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and rest of your week. Thank you. This concludes the conference. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.